It's a nice New Year's Eve. There's one way in which that's totally natural, and another way it's totally conventional. The natural part is, of course, that the Earth marks this amount of time, 365 plus a fraction of days, as it goes around the Sun. If we lived on Mars, the years would be longer, and Venus, they'd be shorter. The conventional part, of course, is where does the year begin in this ellipse? It's totally arbitrary that this is the Western New Year. In Thailand, they have four. They've adopted not only their original Thai New Year, but also Songkran, which comes from India, and Ruchin, which comes from China. And you can take advantage of the convention by using it to reflect on the past year, see what was good, not only in terms of things that made you happy, but also the good things you did. And then think about what was not so good, primarily in terms of the mistakes you made, the times you did or said or thought unskillful things. And then, as Buddha said, when you think about the unskillful things you've done in the past, there are two reactions. One is you should re recognize the mistake as a mistake and resolve not to repeat it again. And secondly, develop the Brahma Viharas. So, this is a good night for that kind of reflection. What kind of mistakes would you like not to make again? And then as motivation, develop goodwill to begin with. Compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. But with the emphasis up on the goodwill, wishing happiness for others, the people you've wronged, to remind yourself that you don't want to wrong them again, then wishing happiness for all beings, because you don't want to act unskillfully with anybody, and goodwill for yourself that you don't beat yourself over past mistakes, that you have an upbeat attitude for the fact that you're on the practice. You're engaged in the practice that's leading to true happiness, which is why you also want to think about the good things you did in the past to remind yourself that you are making progress. This is a good path to be on. When you think about spreading thoughts of goodwill to everybody, you want to make sure it's not just thoughts. It's expressed also in your actions and in your words. In Thailand, in adopting the Western New Year for January 1st, the Western tradition they've adopted is sending a New Year's card. They call it Sokha Saw which is an abbreviation for Song Kwam Suk, which literally means to send happiness. And there are two ways in which you send happiness. One is through your thoughts, and secondly is sending an example. Because when people go about looking for how to find happiness in the world, they look around. How do other people look for happiness? Who seems to be doing a good job? And one way of backing up your thoughts is to set a good example. The Buddha talks about four activities, or four qualities, that lead to happiness in this life. And as it turns out, they also slough over into the qualities for finding happiness in the next life. So if you want to set a good example, you might want to think about these qualities. The first is having initiative. In the text, they talk about having initiative in the way you make your living, particularly in that you are clever and untiring in making your living in a righteous way. You make your living in a fair way, but at the same time you're clever. You try to figure out new ways of advancing that skill, whatever the skill is on which you base your livelihood. And you try to be untiring, keep being energetic in what you do. You can also interpret this in, in terms of your practice. When you meditate, 
show initiative in your meditation by being clever and untiring. You sit down and things are not working out. Well, what could you do to make them work out better? Think about the different kinds of fabrication that go into a meditation. The way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself in directed thought and evaluation, the feelings you focus on, the perceptions you focus on. What needs to be changed? You change the way you breathe. How do you direct your thoughts to the breath? How do you evaluate the breath? Or if you find that the mind is not willing to settle down with the breath, what other things could you be thinking about right now that would be in line with the Dharma? One of the monks who stayed with the John Lee toward the end of his life noted that even though a John Lee would focus a lot of attention on the breath, it wasn't the only meditation method that he taught. He would teach recollection of the Buddha, goodwill, the unattractiveness of the body, mindfulness of death, all kinds of topics that were related to the Dharma, with the realization that not everybody is ready to settle down in the beginning with the breath. And even those who are usually able to settle down with the breath, will sometimes find that they need to switch over to some other topic, either because an issue has come up in the mind that needs an alternative treatment. When the lust comes up, you need more than just knowing your breath. Although being able to relax the breath energy in the body is one helpful step. But you also have to think about, well, what is it that you're lustful about? And exactly where is the craving focused? We start by taking apart the body in our minds, into its pieces, thinking about the pieces being laid out on the floor, and asking yourself, okay, which organ of the body are you lusting for? And when they're taken apart like that, there's really no, no reason to feel lust. So why is it when they're put back together again, there seems to be a reason? In that case, you start looking back at your perceptions. What is it in there that wants to lust? Sometimes the idea of lust itself is where your craving is focused, not so much on the object or on the fantasies you have around lust. So try to track things down inside. Use some ingenuity. How do you figure this out? There are other times when you feel lazy about practicing. That's when the Buddha has you engage in mindfulness of death. To remind yourself, death could come at any time. And think about the Buddha's analysis of what happens when you die. He has the analogy of a flame being blown from one house to the next, latching onto the wind as it goes. In the same way, he says, we latch on to craving at that moment of death, and we'll just go. And you know how blind craving can be. And at the moment of death, you can imagine how desperate it might be. Is your mind ready and prepared so that it can hold things into control? That much of a thought should be in the background, because when you Engage in mindfulness of death. It's not like you're thinking about death, 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 death all the time. You remind yourself, well, what do I need to develop in order to prepare? And then you focus on preparing that. It's like walking along a tightrope. You focus on the tightrope. And if your mind wanders from the tightrope, you have to remind yourself, no, you can't. Because if you do, you're going to fall. So staying focused on the tightrope, that would be focused, say, on the breath or whatever. Meditation is necessary right now. And the thought is, you could fall, is there only when you start wandering away. That's when you remind yourself, death could come at any time. Why are you wandering away? That gets you back to work. 
So try to be clever and ingenious in your meditation. And be untiring. Find ways of keeping at it, keeping at it, because there always is a source of energy in some place inside where you can keep on doing this, except when you sleep. This is one of the reasons why we have long sits like this every now and then, to remind yourself that you do have these resources that you have not tapped into, that you can tap into when you need to. That's how you stay untiring, and this is how you show initiative in your practice. The next quality the Buddha recommends after initiative is that you, or consummate, he says, in vigilance, learning how to maintain the gains that you've got. Now again, in the text he's talking about the wealth you've gained from your livelihood. But you can also be vigilant about not throwing away your meditation when you get up and leave. For a lot of us, it's like an object that's on our lap. As long as we're sitting here, it's safely in our lap. As we get up, it just falls off on the ground. You have to remind yourself the breath is still here. The possibility of the mind to wander away is also still here. Why do you let it wander away when you've got something good? Whatever good you've got out of the meditation, try to maintain that as you go through the day. And notice what it is that pulls you off, whether it's an urge that comes from within, or something strong that comes through your senses from outside. And think about how you can withstand that. And John Lee's images of having some good food in a, in a bowl, and a cover over the bowl. You don't want the flies to get in. Either the flies of outside distractions or the flies of your own defilements. So once you've got something good with your meditation, maintain it. And here again, you want to show initiative and ways to maintain it, thinking about it and realizing its value. Because if you just do the meditation, throw it away, do it, throw it away. It doesn't develop momentum. But if you value it, protect it, then it can build up over time. The third quality is having admirable friends. You look around you and see who are the people who have admirable qualities in terms of their conviction, their virtue, their generosity, their discernment. Conviction, of course, in the Buddha's awakening, which means conviction in the principle of how important your actions are, because everything the Buddha awakened to comes down to the importance of your actions and what a big difference your actions can make. It's good to be convinced of that, because otherwise people get careless in their actions. even though our actions are our main treasure, our main source of, source of wealth. If you throw the wealth away, what have you got? Nothing really. Just memories about this was fun and that was fun. And those memories can't sustain you. They pull you back. If you take care with your actions, then you can reflect back on the actions the times when you did something good. And that gives you energy. Each time you think about it, it gives you energy. That's why it's wealth. The second quality, virtue. You want to look for someone who sticks by the precepts. It's principled in his or her actions. So you can emulate that quality in yourself. Same with generosity. Hang around generous people. You're going to be the beneficiaries of their generosity. But not just that. The proper attitude is seeing how they are made happy by being generous with their time, with their energy. Not just with the material goods. And if you have that sense that you'd be ashamed not to be generous with your time and your energy, and then you've got the right attitude. Because admirable friendship carries with it the 
healthy sense of shame. When you're around good people, you'd be ashamed not to emulate their qualities. That's the kind of healthy shame that the Buddha recommends. And then finally, discernment. This is defined as penetrative discernment of arising and passing away. And penetrative discernment doesn't mean simply watching these things come and go, but it means noticing when some things come, they're really good. Other things come and they're not. And when they come, why do they come? So you penetrate into their causes, and then you penetrate into which things are skillful and should be encouraged, and which ones are not skillful and should be discouraged. That's a quality that you want to emulate as well. And when you emulate it, then you can set a good example for others. And then finally, maintaining your livelihood in tune. Here again, the Buddha focuses primarily on your wealth outside, that the wealth you've gained, you're not a spendthrift, but also you're not a penny pincher. You spend your wealth in a way that's appropriate to your income, in terms of meeting with your own needs, being generous with others, saving up for the future. And here again, there's an analogy inside. As you think about the amount of time that you spend in helping others, if you help other people to the extent where your meditation begins to get harmed, okay, then you're a spendthrift. If you don't help other people at all, you're a penny pincher. And you're lacking those good qualities, the Buddha said, that come when you look out after others. We know the analogy of the acrobat. You have to look after your sense of balance, the other acrobat has to look after his sense of balance. And that way you protect each other. But there's the other way that this goes, which is that by looking after the other, you look after yourself. In other words, in thinking about others, learning how to make their life easier, make the burden of their work lighter. You're developing goodwill, you're developing com compassion, putting up with their difficult times, you're developing patience and equanimity, all of which are good qualities to have in yourself. So as you develop these qualities inside, this also is a way of sending happiness. In other words, giving a good example to the world. The world is full of all sorts of bad examples right now. But that doesn't mean that the good example you set is not going to have some impact someplace. By being a good person, you're making yourself a gift to the world bringing happiness to the world, both in doing things that make other people happy and in showing other people this is how happiness is found. This is a good example. So as the new year begins, think about sending some happiness out, not just on the day of the new year or the first part of the new year. Send happiness all year round. Thoughts of goodwill on a daily basis. Developing these four qualities initiative, vigilance, admirable friendship, and maintaining your livelihood in tune. And see if you can make it last throughout the year and through the succeeding years. Because you can generate happiness inside, and you can send it out. If you're constantly thinking about how you're going to get happiness from other people, you're a drain on the world. But if you can generate happiness and send it out, every time you breathe in and breathe out, it's going to be a gift.